Hi everyone, welcome to the first uh, lecture for our new class, Physics 330, 430 Experimental Methods in Biophysics. Um, in class, in the lecture, I'll go over some aspects of the syllabus, everything like that, but today the point of the lecture is to do a quick recap of biology. So we're going to try to cram all of freshman biology, I guess, in one class, but just as a reminder, since Students in this class are coming from lots of different departments, may not have biology as a requirement. I want to make sure that when we're getting into what we're measuring throughout the semester that we have an understanding of what the samples are, how it relates to biology. And also with this class intro, I always like to start with like, why should we care? Why are we taking this class? And I don't think there's a better time for uh, better motivation than I guess what we're living through right now with this pandemic that you've seen these images a ton of in the upper left of um, the COVID-19 virus capsid and I don't know if you've ever thought about like how do we get to this picture with the different spike proteins hanging off the end their distribution and uh, the way we got to that picture was tools experimental tools experimental uh, microscopy techniques, identifying proteins with proteomics, mass spectrometry. It's all based on biophysical measurements of these samples. So uh, that's a great motivation of how can we understand this virus. And we'll be going over a lot of the techniques that people are exploring to try to understand this virus uh, and the biology going on. Over here, I have an image from a recent cell paper where they were using cryo-electron microscopy to get high-resolution images of the spike protein. You could see here how the precision in their measurement down to the angstrom level, sub-nanometer level, and showing the protein in its closed form versus its open form when it attaches to the cell surface, showing that up here where there's a lot more variability, um, uh, this conformational change in the protein can then help uh, the spike proteins attached to the cell surface. So people are exploring what small molecules can they design to interfere with that. Um, also with uh, diagnosing the disease, all of the undergrads I know had to take uh, COVID-19 tests. I mean, a false positive like with Mike DeWine is all dependent on like how well you design your experimental measurement for here like when an ELISA assay. Um, so uh, these tools aren't just for understanding, but it's also for diagnosing as well. And I'm guessing that many of you are studying biophysics uh, for your research, for your future grad school interests um, or work interests. So you can think of what tools you're encountering in that way as well. Um, before getting into our biology overview, I do want to note about this class. Many of the, I got many emails over the summer asking about like how much biology is in here. Sometimes biophysics can seem intimidating and that's partially because it is filled with jargon. And I want to note this right off the bat, don't let it intimidate you. A lot of this is based on historical uh, observations, historical terms really based on like physically what people saw or even sometimes with jokes. For example, I've been writing some grants about this protein called SMAD, a signaling protein, and I was like, what does SMAD stand for? And digging through the history and everything, you can see it was named after a joke. It's a signaling protein, that's the start of it over here, but then they also added in here mothers against, uh, like mothers against drunk driving, they added it against this phenotypic uh, expression here. So that's like really it was one groups they were studying the specific protein through a joke in there uh, and that's how this whole family of signaling proteins SMAD 1 through 4. 2 is just indicating that it's the second one in the family or so. So there's no way that anyone would be calling this by its full name. Um, so seeing things with like abbreviations this also interacts with something TGF beta 1, 2, 3, stuff like that. Um, really, when you encounter, encounter these things, you have to see what role it plays. Does it play a role in gross or uh, uh, what does it signal for? 
but you don't need to know the full names. Another example is the hedgehog pathway. And the hedgehog pathway is a signaling pathway that was identified um, in fruit flies. And when the gene for the hedgehog or HH was uh, removed for fruit fly embryos, they got a shape that looked like a hedgehog. And that's literally why they called it the hedgehog pathway because the phenotype reminded them of a hedgehog. So then when more and more proteins in this complex signaling pathway, you can see here all the different players involved. Um, they found some other proteins. They're like, oh, it's in the hedgehog pathway. Let's just name it after our favorite video game, Sonic the Hedgehog. Um, there's things like the hippo pathway, where the phenotype looks like overgrowth of tissue. So it has that phenotype, but that's where those names are coming from. Really like phenotypic des descriptions fitting in with some of the jokes uh, in the biology field. So don't let that intimidate you or pictures like this. Um, you might have to figure that out once or twice for something specific you're looking at, but uh, uh, that does, once you figure out that you're just translating uh, that, it ends up being fine. So with that disclaimer out of the way, um, let's go over the goals for this lecture that we want to cover. I want to cover um, all the biology terms. So what are we trying to measure? With our instrumentation. And we'll see a diagram like this throughout the semester where we're going to be breaking down pretty much all the instruments into the source, the detector, but the important thing here today is the sample. What sample is there? So, or what different types of biology are we trying to identify or measure with our instruments? So we need to go over some of the language and terms, and that includes categorization of living things, um, some of the organization of life and cells. We're going to go over some of the molecular composition and chemicals involved in biology. And then finally, uh, some of the processes such as the central dogma of biology we'll be going over today. So before we delve into the biology, we also need a quick refresher of chemistry. So I saw that most of you guys have taken general chemistry, maybe not all of you as organic chemistry, but we will be using notation, organic chemistry notation here. So pointing out a few things, um, this structure here would be a benzene ring where you can see that this would be a single bond, this would indicate a double bond, this vertice here is representing carbon. We don't always write out all the carbons. If there's any connection between two lines, that's indicating a carbon. And we also don't show all of the hydrogens. So here you can see this carbon has one, two, three bonds. And then there's also a hydrogen here that we don't know. Anything that you have to fill in with carbon would be a hydrogen. We can also see with the purple arrow here and green arrow that that's indicating a bond direction. This solid line is coming out of the page. So we're trying to indicate a three-dimensional structure and this is going back, backwards into the page. So I guess with physics notation, this would be the same as drawing a vector coming out versus coming forward. You can also see here, this is a chiral center. So if you have a carbon that's bonded to four different molecules, you can, four different, uh, four different, different, four different uh, functional groups, that would mean it's chiral. We can see here, anything with a nitrogen, with some hydrogens, that would be considered an amine. And this chemical group here with the carbon bonded to an OH group and an oxygen, this would be a carboxylic acid. 
course, there's many other different functional groups. Um, I won't go over all of them, but amines and carboxylic acids come up quite frequently, along with aromatic groups like benzene, where you would say these carbons are conjugated here. So now, finally, we can get into some of the biology we need to know for this uh, class. And we're going to be talking mostly at the smaller scales at the start of this class, but we'll be moving into uh, cells, tissue, organs, higher scale structures as well. So if we start at the top here, we can define an entire organism on the length scales in biology of around one meter. And we can break down the different types of organisms into eukaryotes. This means it has a nucleus in the cell versus bacteria or archaea, which are both prokaryotes, which means they do not have a nucleus. Archaea, we won't mention that much, but they're typically found in extreme environments. So eukaryotes can also be multicellular as well. So that's what the breakdown here is, is more of the multicellular, how you organize life there. So organs would be something that's around 0.1 meters. Um, these are grouped tissues with a very specific role. Hence like the brain, the liver, stuff like that. Tissues are then at more along centimeter, millimeter length scale. And these are cells that are in the same region of space and are also carrying out a specific function. Brain tissue, muscle tissue, stuff like that. And then cells here would be more along 10 to the, sorry, 10 to the negative fifths of 10 micrometers to 100 micrometers. And this is what we're going to define as our fundamental unit of life. It's also used as a common model system for using like E. coli cells yeast, single cell organisms, where you can also study specific uh, human cells like HeLa cells, you can also look at Cho cells to model specific types of tissues and so. And then of course our favorite thing right now, viruses 10 to the negative eight meters in size, about 10 nanometers or so. And depending, there's debate here if they are living or not, but I would, I've, uh, I believe on the no side because it cannot uh, reproduce independently. They must have a host. We're also able to, it's also worth noting that if you use the terms in vivo, that's meaning that you're doing a study within an organism. If you're working with these cells here, human cells, some people still call cellular work in vivo, but that's kind of a stretch. It's not an organism. While E. coli cell yeast, the single cell organisms, can you call that in vivo possibly, while in vitro would be outside. And if you're doing a study in organ tissues or cells for multicellular eukaryotic organism, this would be called in vitro and so. Um, and then you can also make here in silico, and that would mean outside of any living aspect here, this would be like in glass cubets outside of the cell as well. So focusing more in detail on the specific aspect here of the cells it, itself, I already said that's the fundamental unit in life, and why do we consider it so? Well, it's physically isolated by a membrane. It is also functionally autonomous, meaning 
that it has, it can work on its own. It has all the molecules and machinery to self-replicate. And that's why we call it the independent unit of life. So I already discussed this briefly that we classify it based on, we classify different types of cells based on their complexity. So I mentioned the prokaryotes, no nucleus, how we went over that there's a bacteria and archaea and the DNA is instead stored in a plasmid, or stored in a nucleoid. And that takes up one third of the volume of bacteria. So just emphasizing that DNA, nucleic acids, the ability to reproduce there um, is a substantial component here. While with eukaryotes, That's going to include all the multicellular organisms, so we can have fungi, plants, animals, and the like, and they do have the nucleus. So that's the important classifications of cells. Um, also worth noting over here, I have this diagram that we have the cell cycle, that cells will differ in their properties based on like their dynamics of growth, division, and they can change shape during this time, size to a certain extent, um, and their motility. So you can see here that there's an interphase that you can break that down versus mitosis when they're undergoing division and there's a G1S, G2, and then different aspects of mitosis here. So in case you encounter those in your readings um, or different parts that people are studying within the cell, we can get into more details of that later. So we've talked about the organism, organization of life, but within the cells itself, there are there's organi organization as well. There's membrane bound and also membraneless organelles. The most common ones that you've heard of are the membrane bound ones, but I do want to talk about the membraneless organelles. That's kind of a hot topic in biophysics right now. And that's from phase separation based on, based on changes in concentration, ideas you may have heard from in thermodynamics. Um, and you'll also hear we'll talk about intrinsically disordered proteins and having flexible structure causes this phase separation organization without membranes. And it's, like I said, a hot topic being studied quite a bit right now. It's also worth noting um, the cytoplasm is everything excluding those organelles. And it's gonna be the solvent of the cell. Um, there's also a solvent within the nucleus, the nucleoplasm. But the solvent isn't just like what you would think of like water as a solvent. It's very crowded. And concentrated. So you're at like grams per liter there. So I have this diagram here that's some of the specific organelles that I hope you're familiar with include the nucleus. Um, that's going to be 1 to 10 um, microns in size. It contains all of the uh, genetic information. It has a lipid bilayer with um, nuclear pores to transport the, uh, uh, RNA in and out of the nucleus there. Um, it has most of the genetic material in the cell. Um, we'll get into details about chromosomes and the organization of DNA wrapped around histones. And it also has its own nucleoplasm that differs from the cytoplasm. Next one to, worth mentioning, which plays a role in 
We have all these little ribosomes all over the place, which plays a role in uh, transcription and translation. So that's where you have mRNA go to protein. It has two subunits um, as well. There's usually typically over 10 million of them in mammalian cells and is very conserved across species. Um, we also have the endoplasmic reticulum. You can see that it's organized into rough and smooth aspects. Um, it's important in the assembly of proteins. Any post-translational modifications. So if you're modifying those proteins um, with uh, carbohydrates and the like, we'll bring that up. We also have the Golgi complex here, which packages proteins for export. Um, what else do we want to talk about here? We have lysozymes um, that play a role in degradation. Let's see. Vacuoles. Let's see if any of those over here I can't find it. I also talk about vacuoles. Those regulate pH, uh, waste in fungi and animals. While starch grains are only found in plants and help store energy. Speaking of energy, we have everybody's favorite organelle, I think mitochondria and the powerhouse of the cell. Energy here. Membrane bound. It has multiple membranes here. It contains DNA. And there's a question in the problem set going into details for the different organelles. So I'm just giving you a little taste. Um, and you can pick one of these organelles to study in more detail. Um, also, there's in plants, there's chloroplasts involved in photosynthesis. We also have the cytoskeleton that's everywhere. You don't really see that in here. Um, the centrosome, I guess this over here, the centrosome and microfilament, those will be involved in um, uh, the structure and uh, stabilization of the cells. And the centrosome helps organize those microfilaments and the like. So that's a little bit of a taste of everything that's within the cell. There's even things I, here I haven't really pointed out. Um, an important thing that I mentioned was the plasma membrane that helps define both the cellular space and also the organization of these organelles. And with the cell membrane, the simple model that you may have seen pictures of would be, oh, there's going to be these phospholipids that are hydrophilic heads, the phospholipid bilayer, and this might be the simple picture of a cell membrane, but that's not what it's like. It's much more complex, that you have transmembrane proteins everywhere, peripheral proteins, um, proteins within the membrane. These proteins are also modified with glycoproteins, um, so uh, carbohydrates that are attached to the protein that will change the surface recognition of the cell and changes the phenotypic type of the cell. The membrane is also attached and influenced by forces of those micro, uh, the cytoskeleton within the cell, but also the extracellular matrix, so the proteins that are outside the cell. The cell can then exert forces with these proteins that attach to the extracellular matrix and signal down into the within the cell with the transmembrane proteins. So it's a much more complex place than uh, this very simple picture of the phospholipid uh, bilayer here. So the membrane also plays a huge role in, uh, I guess, sorry, detection of small molecules. Like if you think about neurons in your brain, it's all based on um, signals binding to surface protein receptors here. Um, 
transport in and out of the cell, osmosis, so uh, the response swelling to uh, the amount of water with salts, potassium pumps, water, and the like. Um, and it's usually can be approximated by as a dielectric capacitor with the difference in those irons, uh, ions there. It's also worth noting for bacteria that gram-negative bacteria has two membranes and that plants also have a cell wall at that interface between uh, the inside and the outside of the cell. So that's more of the, I guess, micro scale. All these organelles would be hundreds of nanometers to let's say like tens of microns with the nucleus. If we wanna get smaller than this, let's talk about some of the molecules that make biology work. The most important molecule, I guess, or atom, I guess the most important atom is carbon is key here. That's the molecule of life. That's the molecule that defines organic versus inorganic. And the important thing here is why carbon is so key in life is it's a group four element. It can have that um, four binding sites. Um, it also has to do with the energetics of bonding. So to make or break carbon-carbon uh, bonds, they're stable enough that they can carry out their function but you can easily do reactions as well to change that function. And there's also many other small molecules that are important in biology. This of course includes water, also I guess you can call the molecule of life, and that's gonna be your universal biological solvent. It has unique properties with its hydrogen bonding and dipole moments that you should have went over in general chemistry. This is partially positive, partially negative. Um, you can spend your entire career studying water and still not understand it that much. So uh, we don't have time to go into all the details of water, but its unique properties are important in life. Also, ions are very important for signaling, pH uh, control, uh, electrical control as well, and protein function. So the ions you'll see most in the biosciences include salt, chloride, calcium, carbonate, Got magnesium. You also see with a hemoglobin, you'll have iron. With uh, proteins, or zinc fingers that help stabilize it, um, and of course the hydrogen ion as well. And then the universal energy unit within a cellular environment includes ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And the addition and subtraction groups of those phosphate groups in ATP, if you go from ATP to ADP, so di, so this is for diphosphate, diphosphate, that releases about 18 kBT units of energy. Where this is, the expression of kBT, this thermal energy unit here, where this is a Boltzmann constant, this is a temperature, is what we're going to be using quite a bit in this class, but also you'll see like in the literature, kilocals per mole, joules per mole, um, which are more on the macro scale since we're listening, li listing moles here. So these are some of the small molecules, but let's also get into the macro molecules um, that make up of life. So we're going to go into those now with proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, nucleic acids. Um, so jumping into lipids, I have shown here um, a lipid molecule where we're going to, these are also called fatty acids. 
where it has the hydrophilic glycerol head group. And then linked to that are the hydrophobic uh, fats or long carbon chains. You can see that the hydrophilic glycerol head group, I've kept it pretty simple over here, but these groups can be attached to different molecules. Um, you'll see things like phosphocholine, which is zwitterionic, meaning it has both a positive group and a negative group, which prevents proteins from absorbing to it. So that's why like your cell surface doesn't have a bunch of everything outside of the cell sticking to it. Um, uh, but you'll see, yeah, phospho groups, choline groups, amine groups, you can get synthetically. The fact that we have both a hydrophilic and a hydrophobic portion to this molecule means it's amphiphilic. That means it has both hydrophobic and hydrophilic properties. This amphiphilic property allows things, allows lipids to self-assemble. So there's association of these hydrophobic groups here and where like wants to attract like, hydrophilic wants to attract hydrophilic. So you'll get these special structures where you can have a micelle, which means it's one layer of fatty acids forming a spherical shape. You'll see those simplified bilayer sheets that are used to approximate a membrane, but again, they don't have all the proteins. You'll also see a liposome which shows that spherical shape of a phospholipid bilayer here. Um, so this can model, again, a membrane in a spherical format instead. Um, just like the cell membrane, we can have approximated a dielectric potential difference across these hydrophilic and hydrophobic portion, portions. If you want an H2O molecule to pass through, bilayer, phospholipid bilayer, the cost of that energetically, the delta G, is about 65 kBT. So if you throw this in the Boltzmann equation, or if we do the XP, delta G, or kBT, RT, what you get is a property, a, a probability of 10 to the negative 28. So it's pretty much impossible for a water molecule to transverse the bilayer without extreme energy costs here. And you saw like ATP is just 18, so it does take quite a bit of energy. It's also worth noting based on the different chemical groups or the saturation, you can see here, um, if there's double bonds on the hydrophobic tail, this means that it's unsaturated that means it doesn't have the maximum number of hydrogens while these chains are saturated. And based on the degree of saturation, based on the chemical groups that are on the hydrophilic head, you can have different um, gel to liquid transition temperatures. So this allows for, if you have different mixtures here, you could have uh, of lipids, you can have more solid or gel-like regions and more fluid-like regions where these um, phospholipids can diffuse around versus stay stationary. And that depends on the chemical groups there. And I've listed the temperature of gelation versus temperature of being in a liquid phase here. So based on this, um, the different chemical uh, aspects of lipids here, we can look at different structures of lipids here. I pulled this off of um, Avanti which is a very common uh, distributor for lipids if you want to do research with them. And we have different uh, fatty acids shown here. So based on what we defined of what unsaturated and zwitterionic and amphiphilic means, which one of these molecules would have all three of those properties? And the answer to that would be this molecule here, um, B. So the fact that we have these double bonds here means it's unsaturated. 
The fact that we have both a negative charge and a positive charge here means it's bitter ionic. While here, this molecule, this chloride ion is not associated with the lipid. That would then be diffuse in solution. And then the amphiphilic part is up here. This head is going to be hydrophilic, while this portion would be hydrophobic, meaning that it's amphiphilic then. So that's a bit about lipids and fatty acids that play an important role in the membrane of the organelles, the membrane of the cell, and the like, a very essential uh, molecule. And it's also worth noting here, um, this is cholesterol, considered a lipid because it's always so commonly found in membranes, but you can see it does not have a similar structure to the phospholipid fatty acids shown here. Um, so switching over to proteins, proteins are based on amino acid building blocks. So um, amino acids are, yeah, they're just gonna be the building blocks of proteins. They have the whole library shown here. They're connected, all of these amino acids you can see have carboxyl group, acid group, and an amine group. They can connect and form a bond between that COOH and the NH2. That's going to form your peptide bond. This table here shows the 23 naturally occurring amino acids. And this table you'll see all the time. I'm not going to make you guys memorize the amino acids, but be aware that you should be familiar with them. You can see the full name here, like arginine. You can see its three-letter abbreviation, ARG. You can see its one-letter abbreviation, the letter R. And if you see something like in a protein R23L, that means that the pr protein originally had an arginine at the 23rd position, and then it was mutated, so then the L is a leucine. You can see that we organize these amino acids based on different properties, that you can base them on their charge, here having positive or negative charges, you can see polar amino acids and then hydrophobic amino acids, which are gonna be in um, the center or the core of the proteins that they're part of. Um, important molecules include, amino acids include cysteines where uh, the thiol group here having a sulfur can form disulfide bridges with another cysteine molecule. Um, you can see these molecules have conjugated benzene rings and will uh, absorb in the UV. These are all amino acids that we're going to take advantage of when we're talking about the instrumentation um, as well. With the charges, you can see like a histidine would be uh, uh, used for protein purification with the charge. So there's all special properties of these amino acids. These guys are going to be, the charge amino acids are also going to be like pH sensitive. So you can change that there. Um, it's also worth noting outside of these amino acids, um, I guess this table has 21 amino acids. Two are natural, but we don't produce. We have to get externally. And then also people have engineered unnatural amino acids. And these amino acids have very special chemistries, like you can have a quaternary amine for like click chemistry, if you want to attach something specific, um, if you want to control and have one specific site on a protein. Those have been engineered. Um, if you have a short strand of amino acids, I'll abbreviate it AA, let's say like less than 50 amino acids, that's what we call a peptide. There's peptide synthesizers commercially, which form these peptide bonds one at a time and you can build up your chain of amino acids where each of these circles represents an amino acid. Um, and also worth noting is these amino acids are chiral molecules. In the natural chiral direction are L amino acids. Um, 
where L is a biological notation um, uh, for the chirality. So you can see here, this chiral center, you can then count over and get that chirality that all, most amino acids are gonna be L naturally, which is still being studied, but uh, moving on from there, amino acids not only build up peptides, but they also then build up proteins. So that arbitrary distance or the arbitrary arbitrary length is something greater than 50 amino acids would be considered a protein. These can vary greatly in size. So like 53 amino acids is the length of insulin, while something that's 30,000 amino acids long is like the protein titan that's involved in muscle, muscle tissue. Um, so they can vary greatly in size, hugely. Um, there's different degrees of structure in proteins that you need to be aware of. The primary structure is just the sequence, the order of the letters, the order of the amino acids. The secondary structure is then when hydrogen bonding drives the formation of alpha helices, beta sheets. You can see over here that you can see the hydrogen bonding taking place. They form this sheet-like pleated structure that's called a beta sheet. They can also form beta barrels with fluorescent proteins we'll talk about later. While if they coil up, we can again see the hydrogen bonding here. That's what we call an alpha helix. And depending on the order of the amino acids and their specific properties, they'll form these structures or they can also stay intrinsically disordered or uh, random coil. So this IDP is intrinsically disordered. There's a lot of overlap in polymer science here with intrinsically disordered proteins. And this is also the area that's hot with those phase separations as well. The tertiary structure is then the orientation of the alpha and beta sheets to one another. Quaternary structure is then the formation of like dimers, trimers, like higher order structures of proteins coming together. So we sometimes call subunits for the monomer. And then there's even quinary structure that you may not have heard of, but quinary would then be surface interactions between proteins that are driven by environment. So that crowded, I mentioned that the cytosol is very crowded and can be confined in between organelles or in certain spaces. Those can drive intermittent interactions between assembled proteins forming larger uh, complexes. Um, and these may be intermittent or they may be driven by changes in the osmotic pressure uh, within proteins. Another term to be aware of is the isoelectric point, or sometimes it'll be called the PI. And that is the pH where a protein is neutral. electrostatically neutral. Okay. Bit about proteins and breakdown again of these degrees of the structure. Here I'm just showing, again, this, these are your different amino acids here, lysine, glycine, histidine, serine, leucine, all the like that can then be simplified to a letter code. This would be your primary sequence. Secondary structure is these primary sequences being organized into alpha helices and beta strands, but they can still randomly orient towards one another. How much alpha hel helical random coil structure is in? And when they start to orient with one another, that's our tertiary structure and folding um, into domains. And then finally, if they start to assemble with one another, 
you can see that then the, that would be our quaternary structure. This is a visual representation as opposed to what I listed on the previous slide. Proteins have a huge importance in the cell. Um, they're going to be 20% of the mass of the cell. And they're the workhorses. They're going to be carrying out lots of different functions. And the structure of the protein is directly related to its function. So this is a huge area of biophysics where people are understanding how do proteins fold that then gives them their function. With the length of these chains and the number of degrees of freedom, they should be able to take an, an infinitely large number of conformations, but they all fold to a specific structure so they can carry out these special um, functions. So a lot of the instrumentation we'll be talking about will be based on like the structure with high resolution, um, and those are going to be static while instrumentation that focuses on the function are going to be looking at temporal changes, uh, conformation, and folding of the protein. We'll get into that later. So the function of some of these proteins include enzymes. Those are going to be biological catalysts. where this is kind of a cartoon here of what you'll hear, enzymes having a lock and key mechanism. This is a very historical term and it's not always true, so I'm gonna draw a line through it. That That's not how they always work, but that's kind of what's being shown here, where if you have this enzyme, this is the active site here, you're gonna have your substrates or your ligands come in and bind and lock into that pocket. Then the protein undergoes a conformational change and brings those two together, producing a product that then would be something like these shapes brought together or so. Um, it's also with enzymes, you might hear the term allosteric, And what that means is a molecule can come over, let's say over here, far away from this active site and then change that conformation of the protein, change the conformation of this active site, and then change the overall activity of the, of the enzyme. So this is allosteric. Allosteric sites means like a location away from the active site. Changes activity. The function of other proteins include motor proteins that will take energy and transform it into some type of mechanical work. We have signaling proteins and many others that we'll be going into detail. So moving on to our next small molecule that's important in biology includes sugars and carbohydrates. These are all going to be cyclohexane-based molecules, and you'll typically see them drawn in a chair conformation. So this is a flat structure where each of these represents a carbon, but you can also sketch it out in this alternative conformation um, table or chair format. So you can see here, um, I guess, monosaccharides are the individual sugar units. While polysaccharides are going to be polymers of those individual sugar units. It undergoes a reaction where you lose a water molecule forming this bond over here. Um, so this is a cellulose polysaccharide here. Uh, Carbohydrates are also chiral, but they're D predominantly chiral. And you'll see that they have biological roles for structure, like the cellulose I just mentioned, for energy storage, such as starch or glycogen. And it's also worth noting 
that uh, sugars play an important role in glycosylation or post-translational modification of proteins. So after a protein is made, it can be decorated with a bunch of different uh, sugar units. You'll see them drawn as these type of cartoons where each of these colors and shapes represents a different type of sugar unit. Um, this is what really drives the great vast number of different proteins compared to the number of genes that we have that we'll talk about a little bit later. Moving on to nucleic acids, everybody's favorite, DNA, and then also RNA, where the D here is deoxyribose, the R here is ribose, the sugar unit is different. You can see here the sugar unit that also has this phosphate, where the phosphate allows us to be hydrophilic, and then also electrostatically neutral, it's important. RNA uses uh, these nucleotide bases and DNA, where DNA uses thymine and adenine pairs and guanine and cysteine pairs, while the difference with RNA is you have uracil and adenine. You can see that these pair up to a complementary strand um, through hydrogen bonds, three with guanine and cytosine, two with adenine and thymine, and then the end of these Nucleic acids are defined by the 5 prime N ending with the um, phosphate, the 3 prime N ending with the sugar unit shown here. Um, so these are important parts of DNA and RNA. The structure of DNA when it's paired up is the infamous double helix, where the spacing here is 3.4 angstroms between uh, the distance between each of these laddered steps between the paired up nucleotide bases, but there are other conformations of DNA. ADNA is more compact. ZDNA uh, is a helix in the opposite direction or opposite chirality. So be aware of that as well. So of course DNA and RNA is important in maintaining all the information for producing proteins. It has the genetic information. So DNA in a human is about 19,000 genes, where genes have the information to uh, for one type of protein. Um, molecular machinery goes through and finds a promoter region or a code of A, T, C, and G that says, hey, start making a start looking for the protein information here, and then it also has an area with the stop code on series of those nucleotides that tell it, okay, here's the end of it. Um, but the majority of DNA is non-coding, and the use of that is debated, and uh, also can code for functioning RNAs that carry out jobs in addition to proteins. Um, you may hear of the spliceozyme, which is a uh, protein assembly that removes these non-coding regions, and we can talk about that. So like I mentioned with the post-translational modification, there's 19,000 genes, but there's about 10 to the 6 proteins in a human cell that can be made, and that's what those changes after uh, translation. It's worth noting in this figure here, we're showing DNA organization. within the nucleus. It's not just your double helix. It ravels around in coils around specific proteins called histones. Those histones then assemble into something in the nucleosome, and you can then coil that up to form the chromosomes that are within the cell. Um, so those are, this is all in eukaryotes. And then in prokaryotes we have we have plasmids or rings of DNA as well. Then RNA, the function of that is it's the middleman between uh, DNA and proteins. So there's different types of RNA. There's mRNA or messenger RNA. Uh, 
And that goes from the nucleus to the ribosome. Our RNA is part of the ribosome. And then tRNA or translational RNA is going to be the middleman between mRNA and the amino acid in the assembly within the ribosome. ribosome. You can also see here this cartoon is showing that single strands, RNA is typically single strands, and it can fold upon itself and pair within itself. Where here this is a hairpin structure. You can also have bulges um, of RNA and have this different uh, secondary structure uh, within uh, single strands of RNA itself. Those are even used for biological sensing in the form of aptamers. So with nucleic acids, you can see that it plays a role within the central dogma of biology, which is really these steps of transcription and translation. How we go from the genetic code of DNA, the precious information that's in the nucleus, to the dirty workhorses of the proteins with our middleman in between. I also note here some other processes of replication or reverse transcription of how you go between these different molecules. So the central dogma of biology is really broken down to is uh, genetic information stored in series in DNA. And that these genes, which is this genetic information for proteins, can be transcribed by molecular machines to RNA. And then finally, RNA is translated in the ribosome. Ribosome, sorry. By binding tRNA, this is mRNA. to generate peptides or proteins. And I mean, there can be an entire class devoted to just the central dogma, so we're not getting, gonna get into the nitty gritty uh, machinery or steps in transcription, translation, and replication and the like. Uh, so to wrap up, some other things that just to note um, genotype is all the information that's in DNA, and all cells within an organism have the same genotype, but the phenotype is the actual different physical expression or differences in the proteins that are there. And this is what is the difference between differentiating between different types of cell types, tissues, like a neuron versus like a blood cell, those have different phenotypes, but they're gonna have the same genotype. We discussed, touched briefly upon signal transduction at membranes, with the transmembrane proteins, mechanotransduction, which is based on physical cues you can have electrostatic cues with like potassium pumps, stuff like that. We're not going to get into all the details of the Krebs and Calvin cycle, but how molecules are processed, how energy forms, um, uh, is worth a reminder that that's covered in biology. Later in the semester, we will definitely be getting into evolution and changes in the genetic code under different pressures. Um, and through different generations. This is definitely a hot area in experimental biophysics at the cellular level. And then we'll also definitely get into some of the omics. So omics meaning collecting lots of data about the genes, proteins, metabolites that are in the body. This is definitely used extensively with like mass spectrometry 
trichomics. Um, so we'll touch on those later, be aware of them. We'll get into some of the details later on. So if you want some more information beyond this lecture, I have uploaded chapter two of the Leak book um, that goes over, I guess they call it orientation for the biocurious. That covers a lot of what we just talked about. But if you really want to get into the details of the molecules and the organelles and the processes in the cell, um, feel free to pick up from the library this gold standard of molecular, bio molecular biology of the cell. Um, you can take entire courses, entire degrees devoted to this stuff. We barely scratch the surface. Um, so with that, that's the recap of, I guess, Biology 101 that hopefully will help you understand what we're trying to study with our instrumentation we're, com we're covering in this class. Thanks.